Dobro večer, počitovani gledači. Ja sam Dragan Milosavljević, a vi ja slijedite emisija Ta zaspi ako možeš. Večer vas sakam da vi predstavam jedno intervju koje go napravim pred nekoliko dena so jedna, na istina, nevoobičajena ličnost, gospodjeta Avital Lejbović od Izrael. Mnogo mi nam ne zna, se razbira koja je ta, no vi uverujem deka i vo svetski ramki gospodjeta Lejbović ima i to kakvo vljanje. Za kogo stvarno vas boram? Avita Lejbović je direktor na amerikansko evreskijot komitet od Jerusalim veke šest godini. Ta je poranešen port parol na IDF ili na izraelskata armija. Doktor na nauki, ekspert za mediumi, ekspert za socijalni mreži, žena kao što odlično go poznava Balkanot i se razbira bliski od isto kada što vo momentov besne vojna. Među drugoto, ta raboti i kako neoficijalen diplomat na izraelskata država, termin malko neobičan za naši svakenja, među to je nezinata moć i moćta na nezini od komitete takva što praktično to što ona ta go kažuva je na nekoj način misljenje i na izraelskata vlada. Se gospodata Lejbovi zbruvahme na mnogu temi, ta beše ovdje vo poseta na a, Makedonija, prv pat vo, vo svojot život, imaše sred bi so visoki oficijalni lica vo vladata, vo našata emisija zbruvahme za pričinite za nezinot od ajdjenje, ko što se na vistina mnogu važni. Istovremeno zbruvahme za bezbednostata situacija na Balkanot, među to i za dvete vojni ko što praktično naporedno se slučuva, a to ona među Rusije i Ukrajina i ona među Izrael i poveće grupi na Bliski od Istoka. Ono što sakam da ga kažem pred da vi go puštam intervjuto sa gospodata Lejboviće, deka mi je poveće od jasno, deka nekoj od vas početovani gledači nema da se soglasat sa nezinite stavovi, na nekoj od vas vopšto nema i da im se dopadnat među toa demokratija ta bara iziskuva da se slušne sekoje misljenje bez razlika da li nekom mu se dopadja ili ne. Predlagam da go slušneme intervjuto sa gospoda Telebović sa otvorenom i na kraju od nakrištva sami da donesemo zaključok što je vistinata, a što ne. Avita Lebović, direktorka na Amerikansko evrejski od komitet v Jerusalim, vi blagodaram za dojaganje to Thank you for inviting me. First of all, it's a beautiful, beautiful area. Uh, the people are very welcoming and warm. I have to say that I felt uh, warmth and embrace by the people here. Um, I think we have some things in common. The personality, the very warm personality of the people, because in Israel it's the same. The food is similar, because it's a little bit Mediterranean, like we have in Israel. Weather similar for sure we also have a very hot summer in israel but i think overall that the potential of the relations between israel and macedonia need to be maximized we are not there yet to je veke moje to sledno prašanje vi ostvarivte ovaj denovi važni sredbi so predstavnici na makedonska ta vlada može li da mi otkrijete zašto v sučnost razgovaravate I came with the main message that since you have here a new government, uh, which uh, is very open to the possibility of strengthening the relations with Israel, now is the time to do it. Now, I want to say thank you, first of all, to the government of Macedonia that after October 7th actually supported Israel in a very good way and vocal way. However, more needs to be done than only messaging, which is important, but there is a lot more to be done. That was my message in all of the meetings I had, in all of the different levels. Ako razbiram dobro, iako odnosite među Makedonija i Izrael se dobri, vek je podolgo vrema, nema sredbi na povisoko nivo među predstavnici na dvete vladi. So even more than, I think, seven or eight years, even 12 years, and um, the answer should be asked here, not, not in Israel, because Israel is open to forging new relationship. I mean, if I'm looking, for example, in the relationship that Israel has built with Albania, where we were 12 years ago, where we are today, the same could happen with Macedonia. In terms of tourism, investments, business relations, IT, the whole package. You know, Israelis, when they go to travel, they do not know what is Skopje. And they are missing out on this beautiful 
archaeological uh, site that you have here with the beautiful statues and the bridges and the beautiful monuments and the Holocaust Museum that you built here with such a big investment. Israelis have no idea. But imagine that there will be a direct airline flight from Tel Aviv to Skopje. Two hours, two and a half hours, that's it. You know how many Israelis would love and welcome the opportunity to fly directly and come here? I'm sure there will be tens of thousands who would love to do it. But the opportunity right now does not exist. In order for me to get here, I did a lot of efforts, but it was important to come. But I'm not a tourist. So this is just one sector that we could work together. Another idea, 30% of the population here is Muslim. In Israel, 22.7% of the population is Muslim. Perhaps we could share common knowledge about how can you integrate in the best way a minority in your country, in education, in the public sector, in the academic field, everywhere. In Israel, for example, we have a law that actually is asking every official ministry to offer an equal opportunity to the minorities whether it's the broadcasting uh, channels, whether it's either of the ministries, uh, public acad academies, and so on. In all of these, you have to give positions also, to offer positions also to minority, to the Muslim minority. So I'm sure we are very similar in that. So we could maybe even work on that. So in other words, the spectrum of areas for cooperation is huge. And the question is, if Macedonia, the new government, is interested to put an effort on this and revive these relations, which once in the past were very, very successful and close. Добро, каква е вашата импресија? Има ли позитивна реакција од македонска страна на овие идеи од ваша страна? I have to say, I received positive indications from all of my meetings. However, I have been in this field for many years, and it's very important to hear the messaging, but it's more important to see the practicality. So I think that 2025 will be a year of test to the relations, whether it will stay in the same level or will it increase. I do want to mention, though, that we have an ambassador in Israel from Macedonia after four and a half years, which Macedonia did not send an ambassador. So for me, it's a very positive step, which is also an indication of maybe doing more things. If you understand well in the Museum of the Holocaust, it is one of the greatest in the world. Can you tell me how it feels in the world of the Holocaust, in the world of the Holocaust, and where it is explained in the past 70th year? You know, I have a personal connection to the Holocaust. My father is a survivor. He was born in 1940 in the ghetto in Lodz in Poland and came to Israel in 49 after he and his family, his brothers, his mother, his father escaped from one area to another. Um, his mother lost most of her family and the other side of the family survived partially. And, um, and this is an area which is very, very dear and close to me. Therefore, when I heard that there is such a museum here, I immediately took time from my busy schedule and went and visited. I was quite surprised by the prime location, by the beauty of the structure, and also the thought that went into the museum itself. For me, it was a very good experience. I also understand that a lot of children youth are visiting the museum on a constant basis and I think it's very important that kids in Macedonia are learning about the Holocaust because it touched the Jews in this time but this is something that could repeat with other nationalities and as a part of education and issue of values I think it's very important uh, they're they are witnessing it also. Holocaustot во Македонија е дел од историјата на Македонија со кој што ни е абсолютно не би смелен да се гордееме, напротив. Меѓутоа, историски факт е дека Холокаустот на евреите, односно уништувањето на еврејската заедница во Македонија во текот на Втората светска војна е резултат на 
на делување воено и политичко на сосема други сили кои што во тој момент ја окупирале Македонија. И сега она што загрижува, барем овде нас не загрижува, е фактот дека некој се обидува да промени таа историска вистина и да ѝ даде некаков, а, а, некаква друга перспектива. First of all, I see this uh, kind of um, historical arguments with other countries. It's not unique to Macedonia. We've seen in other uh, places around the world, and, and I understand the complexity of the issue. However, I think that for us as a society, wherever we are in the world, the biggest challenge is how do you preserve the memory of the history and how do you teach the next generation? For example, in Israel, the number of Holocaust survivors today is about 130,000. And every year, this number becomes smaller and smaller. So you don't have the live witnesses to tell the story from their perspective, when they were young children, when they were youth. A few years ago, my mother invited all the grandkids and asked my father to tell the entire story of his Holocaust. And, you know, we taped the whole story so it will be a live evidence forever. And I know that my kids will then give one day this memory to their kids. And this is the biggest challenge. So I will not go into different conflicts, but this is an issue I see in, in many, many areas. And uh, the memory issue will be critical. I do want to say, though, that I'm very happy with the fact that there is no anti-Semitism in Macedonia. And this is a message that I will definitely take back to Israel because we are seeing the situation in other countries in Europe. We are seeing what is going on in the U.S. The increase in anti-Semitism is frightening and also very steep. And here, nothing. The Jewish community is living safely, is well integrated. It has a lot of impact in some of the areas, in the government, in other places, in business, other places. And I think that could be a role model for other countries. Еврската заедница во Македонија е прилично мала, за жал, но колку таа може да влијае на подобрување, на унапредување на односите на меѓу Израел и Македонија? I think that Israel is the glue for the Jewish people. Now, I personally don't care if you are a religious Jew, a secular Jew, half religious, traditional. For me, it doesn't matter. Everybody can choose, you know, their own way of practicing Judaism. You want to celebrate a holiday once a year? Fine. You want to celebrate three times a year? Fine. You want to celebrate a Christian holiday and a Jewish holiday? Also fine. So Israel is the glue for the Jewish people, whoever they are and however they would like to act. Um, at the end of the day, there is importance to visiting Israel. I think the Jewish community here, but also the Israelis, the Jewish community. Whenever I travel abroad, I try to meet with Jewish community members. I try to go to the synagogue. I try to go to and visit the Jewish center because we are one people. So we are spread all over the world, but we are one people at the end of the day. And um, we always see it in times of crisis, not only, but also in times of crisis, especially when the Jews all over the world unite. And I can share with you that what happened after October 7th is that a lot of Jews all over the world that did not belong to a certain Jewish organization or synagogue, they went to join because they wanted to be belonging. They wanted that sense of belonging to another body, to another, like them, just to be a part of, of a group like them. So this is, I think, very, very uh, critical. By the way, I think we're the only country in the world that actually has uh, this kind of um, representatives. Uh, it's called the Jewish Agency. We have a body, and they send very young uh, teachers in their 20s who teach the Jews all over the world the language, songs, culture, things like that. And I think we're the only ones who do that in this quantity uh, because part of the culture, part of the Jewish culture, and even if you are in a remote place, you cannot make it to Israel, this is really a taste of Israel. Many times it's the first time they will meet an Israeli in their lives. Кажавте неколку примери за кои практично објаснуваат успехот на Израел, но можете ли 
какво конкретно ми кажете? Како една толку мала земја, а, со ограничени ресурси, како што е Израел, а, рековте дека е прично слична со Македонија, е толку успешна, исклучително напредна, богато обштество, кое што во прилично непријателско обкружување се држи и продолжува напред. I would say it's a combination between patriotism and creativity. First of all, the Israeli people are very patriot. They would like to give back to their country. They want to help the country. They want to volunteer. They're very active politically. The voting rate in Israel is close to 70% in the Jewish sector. In the Arab sector, is around 55%. So very, very patriotic. You see a lot of Israeli flags on, on homes. Um, this is something that I think Israelis are born with. And the second part, creativity, is something about the character of the Israeli. If there's a problem, no problem, we'll fix it. We'll immediately think about a solution. And therefore, today in the world, there are so many solutions which Israelis invented that you may not even know it's Israeli. For example, discon key. Remember discon key we had once? Now... In the beginning, it was huge kind of boxes filled with data, but now you have disk on key. It's very easy. And this was an Israeli invention. Or cherry tomatoes. Uh, or Waze, the Maps uh, application. Um, so there are million kind of inventions that Israel gave to the world because we needed it for ourselves. We wanted to find solutions, and we are very creative people. It's not only in security, but it's mostly in many, many areas. So I think the combination of patriotism and creativity brought the country to where we are. In terms of numbers, by the way, we don't have a birth rate which is very low like in Europe. Our birth rate is 3.2 children per family. It has been increasing also in the last decade. And this is also an indication of the quality of life that we have, although we do live in a very tough neighborhood. Вие сте директор на Американско еврейскиот комитет во, во, во Ерусалим. Морам да кажам, односите меѓу САД и Израел се речиси совршени, со децени и наназад. На кој начин Израел успева да ги одржи на толку високо ниво односите со најмотната земја во светот објективно, дури и во ситуации кога често пати во светот има, би рекол, мислење кои што се далеку од позитивни за Израел. Two main reasons. Number one, it's the shared values that we have. Israel and US have the same values. Uh, and this is how we run our countries, democratic, liberal, um, human rights, all of these issues are very very similar. So without this solid foundation, you can't reach such a strategic uh, cooperation. That's number one. The second reason is mutual interests. At the end of the day, the U.S. wants to be positioned in a good, practical, effective way in the region, in the Middle East. And therefore, it needs a very close ally. And Israel, the only democracy in the Middle East, with a strong army, strong intelligence, strong economy, and shared values, as I mentioned before, is the potential, the best potential partner there is. Now, these relations have been nurtured and built for decades, for many, many decades, with all parties, Republicans, Democrats, and different governments in Israel, from the right side, from the left side. And I think they have proved themselves tremendously, because right now, as I'm speaking to you here in Macedonia, in the area of Israel, there are a very big amount of uh, American vessels which are at Israel's protection, which have been shipped especially from other areas to protect Israel. This is a clear indication of the strength of, of these relations. Also, this month, we are about to mark four years to the Abraham Accords. And the Abraham Accords, which is the peace relations with the Emirates and Bahrain and Morocco and Israel were actually forged by the U.S. And again, we are creating this kind of a moderate block of countries in the Middle East, which are pro-West, pro-values, and they have to be uh, 
a protector with the other block, which is Shiite, pro-terror, those kind of things. So we are here for the same goal. The U.S. is very invested, very much invested. Uh, by the way, it's also threatened by the same enemies that Israel has. So again, we have joint uh, causes here. And um, we are very fortunate that we have such a strong ally. Baza na вашите одлични односи со САД и со Европската унија, би рекол дека Израел прилично ги намали односите со Руската Федерација во ситуација кога Русија војува со Украина, а Израел пак се навгја практично во војна со повеќе организации на Близкиот Исток, Хамас, Хезболлах и така натаму. Дали беше избор на Израел да ги... Да ги в лоши односите со, со, Руска, со Руската Федерација, во смисол на тоа дека свесно тоа го направите или едноставно тоа се случи заради е, геополитичките објективни причини? Прво од ова, Русија е била во Мидл Ист уред since the 50s. So this is not something new that Russia is operating in the Middle East. For us, they are on our border because Russians are sitting in Syria. It's on the Israeli border. So from our perspective, we do want to keep some sort of a formal relations with Russia. They're on our border. They're our neighbors. On the other hand, there's also a big Jewish community in Russia of 200,000 people. So obviously we need to continue those relations. But I do want to say that since there is a war in Ukraine, um, of course, Israel is standing with Ukraine. There is no question about it. And we are supporting the right of Ukraine to continue and exist uh, as a country, as an independent country. There's also a big Jewish community in Ukraine as well, of course, that we are concerned with them. But here is an interesting fact. Ever since the war started in, with Ukraine and Russia, we have an ungrowing number of Jews coming and immigrating into Israel from Russia and from Ukraine, tens of thousands. Every year. Tens of thousands. Tens of thousands every year come to Israel, they leave Russia, they leave Ukraine, and they immigrate to Israel, including now when there is a war in Israel. So the relations with Russia are on different levels, uh, as you can see, um, but they have their own interests, and Israel has its own interests. Sometimes the interests conflict, sometimes they merge. We have to uh, live side by side. Моето мислење, поправете ме ако грешам, дека двете војни, тоа меѓу Русија и Украина и таа на Близкиот исток, се на некој начин а, поврзани, односно акциите што се случуваат на едниот и на другиот фронт имаат влијание едни а, врз други. I agree with you that the connecting factor between the two arenas that we are seeing now is Iran. We are seeing how Iran is selling uh, to Russia drones with explosive capabilities, the kind of drones that Russia is using against Ukraine, and this could kill innocent people, of course. So this means that you see Iranian footprints in the war with Ukraine. In my part of the world, we are also seeing Iran of all the fronts. Let's begin with front number one, Gaza. Iran is sending money and supporting an organization called the Palestinian Islamic Jihad in Gaza. Let's go to the West Bank. The West Bank is filled with Iranian money, which is buying ammunition for people to create explosives, to train, those kind of things, of course, against Israel. Number three, the front with Lebanon, with Hezbollah. Hezbollah was built by Iran in the early 80s. It's funded, it's armed by Iran. The main intention of Hezbollah is to make sure that Israel doesn't exist. Let's go to Syria. In Syria, front number four, there are revolutionary guards bases on the ground in Syria. You know, Syria is a failed state, by the way, just like Lebanon. It's divided into five or six parts, and in one of the main parts, a lot of revolutionary guard bases. Let's go to uh, arena number five or six, Iraq. Iraq has a lot of pro-Iranian Iraqi militias. As a matter of fact, a few hours ago, one of these militias tried to fire a drone to our port in Haifa, which we were able to take down. Front number seven, the Houthis the, in Yemen. Now, the Houthis in Yemen are a lot farther distance-wise from Iran to Israel. 
But who gave them the know-how? The Houthis don't have the capability and the know-how to develop weapons. Iran, again, is helping. From the Iranian perspective, it's a great opportunity. They don't need to dirty their hands. They are using proxies all over the Middle East to attack us. So the Iranian factor which exists in Russia and the Iranian factor which exists in the Middle East are similar. But all the neighbors and all the terror groups that I mentioned, make no mistake, they don't want to see Israel exist. It's a different situation. They don't think Israel has the right to exist. And they were created to erase Israel off the map. This is their goal. This is the ideology. And this is what we've been facing in the last 11 months. By the way, we've been facing it since the day Israel was founded. But in the last 11 months, this is one of the most challenging periods of our history, without any doubt. Тук доаѓаме до едно навистина а, тешко прашање кое што мора да се каже од а, 7 октомври Израел е практично во, во војна со со повеќе формации на своите граници а, војна која што трае веќе 11 месеци до овој момент и војна во која што има огромен број на на жртви меѓутоа и огромен број на а, цивилни жртви пред се во Газа при што објективно меѓународната заедница не се согласува со начинот на кој што Израел војува односно со начинот на кој што се бори особено во тие градски четврти затоа што на тој начин ги над голем број на цивили меѓу нив и деца. Look, the first rocket that hit Israel from Gaza was in 2001, 23 years ago. For 23 years There are rocket fire coming from Gaza, from terror groups firing at Israel. Show me one country in the world that would live with rocket fire for one week, not for 23 years, one week. And from time to time, Israel would go to a very limited operation, you know, to find rocket launchers, the rocket factories, a few days, a few days here, and that's it. But what happened on October 7th? is way beyond that. We had something like 6,000 to 7,000 Palestinians, half were Hamas, others were civilians, who crossed the border in dozens of areas in 6.29 in the morning on the holy day of the week, Sabbath, in a holiday, in a Jewish holiday. And what they did was there, I mean, if you would see the pictures If you would smell the smells, you would understand the level of inhumanity that were expressed. You would see whole families, parents and children, their hands were cuffed together, burnt alive, burnt, children and, and, and parents. You would see 12-year-old and 14-year-old girls who were raped next to their parents and then killed. You will see body parts that they took, they sawed with a saw. They use certain fuel that burnt the bodies in such a high temperature that nothing was left but dust. It took us many weeks to identify bodies. We had to invite pathologists from all over the world. They've never seen anything like it. We opened a special morgue because we couldn't have a place for so many bodies at the same time. And then they took 255 hostages. And they're still keeping 101 hostages. Who kidnaps a baby? Who kidnaps kids? Who kidnaps people in their 80s, in their 70s, without medicine, without anything? Now, Hamas is not like Israel. They're not uh, under the international law. They can do whatever they want. They can lie. They can publish fake numbers every day about children which are dying or people that are dying. You as someone who's living here, or Europeans as live in Europe, in Europe, or Americans, have no way to check it on the ground. Do you think Hamas is allowing journalists to enter and see what's going on? Israel is taking journalists to, to show. Yeah, but we are seeing a lot of pictures, a lot of videos. But you don't know if the pictures are from Syria, or from Gaza, or from Lebanon. And you are seeing a very tight frame. Let me tell you what the soldiers are telling me. The civilian houses are being used for terror means. You go into a house, a regular house. You go into a bedroom of a child. 
a pink bedroom because it's a girl. You move the bed, there is a carpet. You move the carpet and there is a door to a tunnel under the bed in a child's room. You go to the kitchen, over the sink there is cupboards. The cupboards are all booby trapped with explosives. So all the civilian facilities are used for Hamas. Even the hospitals. The most famous hospital in Gaza is called Shifa Hospital. It's a very known famous hospital. The director of the hospital was appointed by Hamas and was given the rank of a brigadier general. And yes, they have surgery rooms, but they also have meeting rooms for Hamas commanders in the basement. So this is not a civilian normal society based on values of freedom, of liberation, of democracy, of regards to human lives. Do you know that one of the most shocking pictures that will always stay with me, there was a Hamas terrorist that infiltrated one of the communities, the villages on October 7th. He called his parents and he said to them in Arabic, and he filmed himself because a lot of the terrorists had GoPro cameras. It was part of their gear. And he filmed himself talking to his parents saying, Mom, Dad, I killed Jews. I was so successful. Please be proud of me. And he's speaking to his mother. And his mother is congratulating him. Now, this is an older woman. You can hear according to the noise. This is the values you're raising your child. So we need to see a different era in Gaza. We need to re-educate the people. We need to re-radicalize. But how are you going to do that? Sorry to interrupt. We need the help of the moderate Arab countries, which, by the way, went through similar process in the past. You know, in the beginning they were closed, they were now more open. Suddenly you see uh, international competitions, FIFA, others are hosted by a lot of Arab countries. American universities are present in these countries, so when you're ready to make that move, it could be very successful. So we would need their help. We would need to make sure that we have very strong security measures so October 7th will never return. Because on the border of Gaza, we have 60,000 people who left their homes a year ago, and they have not returned, and they will not return until the security and stability is re retrieved. So with all the respect to our friends in Europe, the most important thing for us is our defense, our security, our stability. And I understand the criticism, but these are people that have never been under a rocket attack in their lives. And we have been in that place for 23 consecutive years. How is it this conflict? Веќе трае 11 месеци и немаме никакви изгледи дека ќе се ќе се намали имаше неколку иницијативи за мир меѓутоа никако да да се потпише нешто конкретно војната продолжува и носи се нови и нови жртви. The war could end in 5 minutes if Hamas will return 101 hostages which he took. But Hamas is not interested. Hamas rejected all the previous proposals. There were 6 proposals. Hamas rejected all of the proposals. Why? Because Hamas's interests are two. Number one, to stop the fighting. Number two, to survive. These are the two interests it has. And the rest, they do not care. They do not care about the people. They do not care about the economy. They do not care about the buildings. They only care about survival, staying in governance, and immediately stopping the war. Now, for an Israeli perspective, we can solve everything tomorrow morning. Let them return. 101 hostages, dead and alive. Approximately 40% are dead. They also smuggle, they also kidnap bodies. They killed and kidnap bodies. Um, older people and so on. Let them return all of them to Israel. And then we can stop the war. But they don't want to do that. Again, they don't have an interest to do that. And this is also a challenge. We're not talking with another country you know, that has the same values. This is a radical, anti-Israeli, Islamist organization that doesn't want to see us exist. This is the ideology. You can read, you can read Hamas Charter, and it says there that the role of the Palestinian woman is to raise her children to jihad. 
So what kind of society raises their children to, z- to jihad? I will never do that with my children. Но што е со опозицијата во, во самиот Израел? Гледаме на, на вести најчесто дека голем број на луѓе во Израел, израелци, не араби, се бунат против начинот на кој што владата на Бенјамин Нетанјаху се справува со, со Хамас и воопшто како ја води целата операција. Sunday morning, a uh, few days ago, we woke up in the morning to devastating news that six hostages that were alive 48 hours before have been brutally killed by Hamas with a bullet in their head and the IDF brought their bodies back to Israel. The public was so angry and so frustrated and this is the demonstrations you have seen in the streets of Tel Aviv and other places. So the Israeli public, you know, we feel that the hostages are a part of our body, part of our soul. We know the names. You know, you go in Israel to a supermarket and you go to the self-checkout and you see on the screen the picture of the hostages. Everywhere you are, it's surrounding you. Now we have mandatory service in Israel, so we send our kids to the army when they're 18. So we, we each have family members in the army, in the war. So we are very strongly connected. Now, the political system in Israel is very, very democratic. You have 14 parties, and they are building the coalition. They can be new parties, but 14 parties now, which built coalition and opposition. The coalition now has 64 seats. You need 61 and above. And you can change the coalition and the government in two ways. Number one, every four years in the elections. Number two, if the coalition crashes, Right now, coalition is continuing. The protest is a legitimate democratic way to, to speak out, but they will not do anything to the political system. But it's a very critical time of the history of Israel. Or it's not, maybe. Very critical time. But, again, this shows you the involvement and the emotional caring and affection of the Israeli people. But you can't change a government with, with a protest of 100,000 people. Israel is a, is a country of 10 million people at the end of the day, so we also need to remember the proportions. We are a very political country in the sense that everybody has an opinion. If you go to an Israeli family to a dinner on Friday night, everybody will talk to you about politics. We have this side, we have that side. The country more or less, I would say, center and center right. This is more or less the political orientation of the country, although we have left-wing parties as well, but they're smaller. Um, but this is a very difficult time because of the uncertainty, because we paid such a heavy price, because 1,200 people were killed on October 7, because more than 700 soldiers have been killed already. So it's very strenuous times for us. Odnosite so Iran se poveke od jasni, među vas i Izrael i Iran, među toa... Spomenavte nekoliko zemlji so košto može, od islamske zemlji zborom, so košto može Izrael da se robotova. Jedna od njih je predpostavljava me Turcija, megito od tokmu turskijot premijer, odnosno predsedatel se izvenuvam, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, izpravljajo prilično seriozni zakani kon Izrael v poslednjih periodu. With Turkey, let's talk a little bit about the past and the future. In the past, the relations between Turkey and Israel were almost strategic, I would say. You know, an Israeli general sitting in Tel Aviv could call up on the phone his Turkish counterpart and discuss issues 50 times a week. It was very close relations. Until there were a terror group called IHH. They decided to send flotillas to Gaza. Israel said immediately, please don't send the flotillas. Uh, The idea was different. And uh, since then, the relations deteriorated, and all the strategic relations were cut. Now, the, the statements of Erdogan, unfortunately, have a very strong anti-Semite kind of smell. And this is something that we cannot tolerate. The last statement was that he will send, he called to others to come to Jerusalem and help free the Palestinians. So this is almost like calling for a war. And this is, of course, not acceptable. But the future. A few months ago, 
there were elections for the municipalities in Turkey. And as you saw, Erdogan did not win the majority of the elections, but there were others who won, other candidates of other representatives' parties. So I am actually optimistic for the future, because yes, Turkey is stationed in a geopolitical location, which is important. It's a NATO member, and Israel is a NATO partner. So obviously, if I reflect back, and I know what kind of relations we can have, like we used to have 20-something years ago, the potential is there, but we can't have a leadership like that lead it. So looking to the future, we have a chance to fix it after there are changes in the presidency. I think that on April 14th, we crossed a psychological barrier because that was the first time in Israel's history where Iran attacked us directly. They sent, and Iran is 1,300 kilometers away from Israel, they fired 300 drones, explosive drones, ballistic missiles and rockets from Iran to Israel. Only seven, only seven fell in open areas in Israel. All the drones and the ballistic missiles were intercepted in uh, airspace outside of Israel. So from the Iranian perspective, this was a huge failure. But also I think more than anything, this demonstrated the Israeli capabilities and also the coalition that was led by the US and we worked together, whether it's Arab countries, whether it's European countries, the UK, it was a wonderful kind of coordination with huge success at the end of the day. But I'm not delusional, and I know that Iran will learn from its mistake, and they will understand what did not work on April 14th, and will try to improve it. So Iran remains the threat. Now keep in mind that it's not an Israeli problem. And I think that if the world will look at Iran as something with the Middle East and they have nothing to do with it, it's a huge mistake. And let me give you a small example. I told you that Iran is only 1,300 kilometers away from Israel. But they have rockets with a range of 3,000 kilometers. So they can reach Europe. Why do they need to reach Europe? Why are they investing in these kind of rockets? Now, what else did Iran, the, the very extreme Iran regime, what did they contribute to the world? How did they help society? Their own society is under huge pain, lack of human rights. Women are forced to, to, to dress from, from toe to head in a very modest, covered way. They block modernism. Um, so I think we have no choice but eventually to face this threat. Um, I hope it will be a joint effort and not only an Israeli initiative. Последно прашање за вечерва. Вие и покрај сите обврски што ги имате и покрај фактот дека сте начело на еден многу сериозен комитет, дека имате огромно политичко искуство и така натаму, во моментот кога започна војната, се јавивте во воен одсек и практично се вративте во воен униформа, бевте на фронтот и еко сте дама и еко предпоставам дека не беше обврска за вас тоа да го направите. Зошто го се одлучите на таков чекр? We are actually serving women and men in the same kind of war. I mean, you have women in Gaza fighting next to the men. You have doctors which are women in Gaza and you have men. At the end of the day, it's our country. It doesn't matter if you're a woman or a man, if you're a Christian or Jewish or Muslim. Everybody needs to join hands in protecting the country. If we will not do it, who will do it? Now, this is a critical time in our history. And if we don't win the current situation and the seven fronts we are facing, Israel will not exist. It's very simple. So we can't afford to lose this kind of situation. And I'm telling you, mothers with small children left everything and went to the army. And uh, people left their jobs and, and, and went to, to the war. Um, men, women, students. You know that we had 100,000 Israelis who came from trips abroad? They traveled, especially when the war began, 
You know, usually people escape from the country in a war. Here it was different. A hundred thousand came back to join the war. But it's not because we are, we love wars. That's not who we are. It's because we need to defend the country. Because the environment, the neighborhood we're in, is such a violent anti-Israeli environment that we really have no choice but to defend our borders. We will not call other countries to come and defend our borders for us. We never do that. We never will do that. So I think it's relevant to everyone, men and women, wherever they are. Avita Lebovic, thank you for inviting me.